Okay, so uh, welcome. We're going to be discussing creating, exploiting, and protecting intellectual property and intellectual assets um, as you're building ventures and as you're working within the, within the corporate. Uh, we've had some brief introductions on that round the call as we've started um, with, the, with the other two here who've got relevant uh, interest into the topics. And we, I'm going to give some context about creating ventures and Eric's going to focus predominantly on a case study that, um, that where we've been working on recently. As we go through this, if you're watching on a laptop and you've got your mobile phone sort of handy, you can hold the camera up to the screen and scan the QR code and that will take you to the um, that will take you to the the resources and that that I've got and, and that's we go through this and as I said, feel free to post in the chat questions or points of discussion that you've got those up, those up afterwards. So some of the points that we're going to be raising have, have come through the uh, book that I published a couple of years ago, which is around uh, what we term innovative new value chains. So how do you connect new technologies and startups? to uh, build business ventures and change business models in industries. And I'll give some examples of those. So we're seeing a lot of convergence now of technologies and new business models. So uh, new materials, big data, uh, mobile devices, and these coming together and creating very new sort of opportunities. Giving some examples of those, um, in energy generation, we're moving from large um, you know, power stations to more distributed um, energy sort of solutions and electric vehicles, solar panels, wind, wind turbines. So changing industries, and I'll give an example of that in a moment. We're seeing in the health sector that instead of just looking after sick people in hospitals, we've got devices, we've got new active pharmaceutical ingredients, and we've got data now driving health outcomes and wellness. Uh, we're also seeing in um, you know, artificial intelligence, data, blockchain, you know, changing white collar sort of roles um, in, in value chains and that as well. And uh, a bench, uh, an area that I'm particularly interested in at the moment is in retail. We're seeing the decline of the high street, of course. We've seen the rise of delivery sort of types and e-commerce. But what's happening now with blended experience in terms of devices, consumer experience in store, and then sort of delivery. And so I'm involved in a fashion business in that at the moment, um, which is which is revolutionizing the retail space. Um, but also with Rouse, uh, we did a project for a consumer products business, um, and we were looking at the electronic devices and service models for that. And in this case, there's billions of dollars now moving into this into this sector with this electronic device, consumable products, and over 95% of the manufacturing was happening in China, and over 80% of the patents when we were looking for that, working with that corporate on the startup ventures and that within, that within that sort of space. So we're seeing a transformation of industries, we're seeing technologies and that coming together. The other impact that we're seeing at the moment in the aim of our is a tsunami of redundancies and where we've got concerns of wasted intellectual property and wasted venture opportunities. As these corporates have already announced that by the end of the year, they're gonna be making these tens of thousands of executives redundant. And, and I'm gonna say, Eric and I have got some particular experience with some of the corporates that we've been working with in these venture sort of spaces now, where there's intellectual property and assets that could also be spun out or valued and that from, from, from those businesses. So we've got, change in technology, change in business model, and a massive disruption coming through now um, as a result of COVID and the pandemic. So what I briefly want to talk about is the innovative new value chain. So this is, I outlined in my book, and this is sort of one example, this is sort of a generic example of devices and products now throwing off lots of data we're seeing new finance models and we're seeing a new relationship with the consumer because of that direct relationship with the device and the, the, the data that's sort of coming through it. And it's this combination of technologies, startups and corporates, which I believe and aim of our belief is gonna be creating these new value chains. Also importantly, this is a global phenomenon. So 
manufacturing in China, data and artificial intelligence coming out of the USA with brands coming out of Europe. So this combination we think is really powerful in maybe seeing how industries and sectors are going to change. Now some examples you can link here. This is a, an example from the health sector, Bill Toronto from um, uh, Merck's Global Health Innovation Fund, where we discuss around how devices for looking after personal wellness and health coming together with health data in the cloud and looking after patients in the home rather than in hospitals. Another example is within the electric vehicle space. So bringing together now this, this electric vehicles and now data devices and energy storage devices on wheels, they're not just an internal combustion engine which could sit in a drive or in your garage for 95% of the time. There's a lot more information and data being thrown off by this, by this device. And we'll see, you know, as we see with that, that innovative new value chain, what patents are there within this value chain? What brands are there? What data, what other intellectual assets are along that full value chain? And here's an example where we work with a number of corporates in looking at the whole sort of energy production, the power supply chain, the connected devices, the different solutions for battery, grid, vehicle to grid sort of storage, shared vehicle ownership, managing transport systems. So along this value chain, what we're going to be discussing today is where could there be potential patents, intellectual property, intellectual assets along this sort of value chain. So that, that's one of the areas we're going to be discussing in that, that today. The other aspect, which I know from your brief, from brief introductions around the call, China is an important aspect. Um, I said this was a topic of a session we did a couple of weeks ago around the global innovation superpower that is China. And in these examples of health devices, electric vehicles, solar panels, uh, 5G telecoms, we're seeing the corporate, the corporate capabilities and the, the dominance now of some Chinese uh, companies within these new technology and new business model spaces. So that, that's another aspect we're not going to focus on today, but it's, it's one that I think organizations should be seriously looking at for their ventures and for their corporate innovation perspectives. Uh, and one where I said we've worked with Rouse in these, these areas in the past. So that, that's it in terms of the, co the content for framing what we're going to be talking about today with new value chains and, and bringing technology and that together. Um, we've done, say, these previous webinars where you can see the videos and that, that from these. So on our YouTube channel, um, and we've got upcoming sessions with Henkel, Shell, and Innova uh, Innovate UK over the next month to six weeks. So feel free to have a look at those, and we can make these um, slides and that available as well. So my name is Eric, uh, and I work in the uh, the uh, the Rouse Stockholm office. And I'm a principal, and I predominantly work with projects like the one we are going to uh, run through now, and. and hopefully discuss with you uh, towards the end. Uh, so, so that's my sort of role. I'm not a, I'm an engineer and an economist. I'm not a lawyer, which is uh, some extent strange in, in, in this world or a patent attorney. Uh, I have this more of a general approach to IP. Uh, this is sort of background and introduction to the project itself. These four sort of bullet points, uh, which can summarize down to, uh, you know, uh, how well aligned is our current portfolio, scope and quality of our portfolio in relation to new business verticals, how does the external landscape look like, uh, and can we, you know, are there other interesting verticals and, and all the other potential partners and key players that we need to consider in our surroundings? And then the sort of fourth bullet point is, is still sort of like an action plan strategy component, which is the synthesize of the first three uh, bullet points. So that was the, that was, uh, I could have done the first bit much faster now, I realized. Anyway, and then I came to this slide when I said, okay, basically we have, given our history of doing these kinds of projects in here in the Stockholm office, we have a fairly standardized approach in doing things, even though every project is unique, and it typically consists of three steps, uh, whereas the first step is the technology and business context. The second step is the sort of portfolio and the external environment. 
And the third step is strategy and closing the gaps. And the first step is where we try to emphasize, we try to spend most time, because if we don't do that, the other two steps, number two and three, will be you know kind of shallow and not very well grounded in the business. And I think that that is a fairly unique uh, way of thinking uh, for being an IP firm, that we emphasize the technology and the business context over the IP itself. Um, um, and that's, uh, yeah, so, and then I said, let's go down into sort of the first bit of this um, uh, uh, um, process, this technology, and see how we do that in, in, and try to give you a brief introduction to how we do that. Um, and basically what we do is we do these kinds of analysis and we call them high resolution context or high resolution maps. Uh, and what we do is we break down an, a, a, a business or an offering or a product uh, or a service into smaller components. And then we try to figure out these, how these smaller components can be arranged according to two primary axes. Uh, the vertical one is value, in this case for business to business client, and the horizontal one is level of establishment. And when we talk about level of establishment, we're not referring to it as, as you know, uh, whether or not it's patentable or, or any of those things, or if it has any inventive step or you know, all of those things that is related to sort of the IP law. It's, that axis is, 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 is um, comprises of how well established is a certain sort of practice or activity or notion or component or technology in our given context. Uh, so in this case, you see there is a number of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, circles uh, down in the sort of right-hand corner. There's redistribution, wiring harness, houses and pipes, disposal of filter. Those are very much standardized, low-value aspects of our offering. Whereas if you go into the top right, top left corner, you will see there's a there's a few that is is anonymized, something called Active X and Active Y, and there's collection and unit and filter fitting. Those are high value assets or aspects of our offering uh, that um, are less mature or less established in our given business context. Um, and we do this to figure out where and how uh, do we have unique values. Uh, so it's not related to IP at all in the, at this stage. It's much more related to how can we understand where we are unique and where we create unique value. Uh, and you can also categorize these ones as you've done here. We talk about product, certain parts of the offering is a product, certain part is a substance, certain part is an, like an ecosystem thing, and also there's software intelligence thrown in the mix as well. Uh, and this is quite a diligent thing we do when we, we, we don't do this on our, ourselves. It's, Actually, we do it more in collaboration with the client, and they and we try to uh, provoke and push the client to, to tell us things about how how, how the, the reality actually look like, and then we try to describe it in this way. And the reason for that we will get to in the end, because uh, when and when, when when we had a discussion with Andrew at one point, he was like, "But the it feels like the the the, the graph is in the wrong sort of in the tilted in the wrong direction, but there is a reason for that, and we will get to that in a, just a bit." Um, but that's the, the essence of how we do this context and, and high resolution analysis. Uh, and then on top of that, once we have that map, we can start you know, analyzing our own IP portfolio, but also the external environment in relation to the map. Uh, and, 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 and basically what we try to do is in a sort of detailed fashion as possible, is we're trying to analyze assets from a number of parameters, but it usually comes down to that you can aggregate them to scope and quality. So you could basically plot where do we have high scope or high, you know, broad assets, and where do we have rather narrow assets, and where do we have high quality assets, and where do we have low quality assets, and and and, and uh, illustrating them in these kind of simple, really effective. Uh, graphs that are easy to communicate for, for uh, IP people, but also for business people to understand them. And in this case, there was um, more than 60 patent assets and a number of additional intellectual assets and such as data and know-how, et cetera, that were mapped in this fashion um, so that we could have a, a, a discussion about what, what does the portfolio consist of, uh, what kind of scope are we talking about, what kind of quality are we talking about. 
And then we can merge this analysis with the first step, creating you know, a situation or you know, something looking like this that we can combine and say, okay, in this space, which we believe is a high value space, this, um, so this is a purple sort of, uh, you know, the purple area, uh, what do we have, what kind of assets do we have in this high value space? And how do they actually how 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 well aligned are them with the, with the, with that space and what kind of scope and quality are we talking about and, and, and here and giving us an indication of what do we need to do or what 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 is our position and so that's a sort of a key combination of a very detailed IP analysis with a very much uh, more general business analysis uh, even though it's in a format that is perhaps not so established. Uh, and then on top of this, we can also add the external environment uh, itself, uh, which in this particular case is that we, we we took all the players in this sort of in this that is active in this you know uh, pink well pink purple space, and then we started analyzing them uh, from a number of parameters in terms of relevance and degree of openness, and started plotting them and trying to figure out okay, but if we would categorize these companies. Uh, Along the sort of value chain, because these have, these companies have quite different, you know, um, how do I say, positions or 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 uh, roles in the value chain is probably a better word for it. Uh, and starting evaluating them, figuring out who are good partners for us, who are more of a uh, sort of open rivals or or, or competitors. And, and are there any complementers in this space that 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 that, that we could perhaps uh, um, piggyback on? Uh, and are they sort of completely unrelated competitors or players that we don't have to take into consideration? Uh, and just to give you a brief on this this graphical illustration of the analysis, the relevance means how how similar they are in offering and position in the value chain. And the degree of openness is how innovation, open innovation initiatives, uh, collaborations, litigation activities, etc. And then we can start mapping them. And, and the size of each of the players is the strength of the position in in, the, in relation to to these two axes. And in total, this landscape, which is not a, it's not a very, you know, it's not a very big IP landscape, but it's still about 1,400 relevant or adjacent patent assets and approximately 60 companies active in this space that our client needs to, to at least have some sort of sense of what they're doing in relation to what they're doing in order to, to um, build value. Uh, so that's very much how we could use uh, IP data to actually turn it into something that is actionable or, or make sense in a business sense. We are trying to use IP data to answer a question that is uh, not related to the infringement or anything like that, more related to, okay, who's out there and can we sort of partner up with them to some extent? Um, so that's uh, that, that part of the analysis. Um, and the sort of last step in our approach is the strategy and closing gaps bits. And when we do build strategies in Rouse, we build strategies not subjected to what you can do or, you know, you know because you can do a lot with IP, but we build strategies subjected to what you should do well how you should use the assets and in this particular case we, we define three principal areas of using the assets the first one was building an ecosystem and, and basically supporting or pushing this innovative new value chain and that's one sort of main reason why they have intellectual assets and why they build an IP portfolio second part or the second use is collaboration and partnerships and and I actually had that question from the client. What's the difference between these two? And, and the difference is the ecosystem approach is a multilateral structure that we need to, that we want to use the IP for. Whereas the collaboration and partnership structure is more of a bilateral structure. Uh, similar, but yet very different. Uh, and communication is that we should use this, these, these assets we have to communicate what we're doing and the value we are creating and thus get more traction. Um, so that's uh, that part uh, that we try to design, and, and and in order to do this, then we we take the map that we saw early on, and we try to digest it and figure out what how can we use how can we basically 
work with these items that we have on the map or the high resolution context uh, in order to create this these these you know uh, areas of use and create the effects we want to do uh, or, or we want to have as an output uh, and basically what we can do then and this is from this particular uh, project is that we can design specific strategies targeting IP targeting specific parts of the context so in this case you see the green the green uh, circles uh, have a sort of like a, a, a number of some smaller circles around them called an ecosystem approach. These are areas where we think, given the IP portfolio and how it's structured and also the intellectual assets related to it, can be structured in order to build a value chain that is uh, more of an ecosystem, very much what Andrew is, is talking about in his book and, and also in the introduction today, like a new innovative value chain that is not necessarily creating value in a linear fashion. And activating IP, uh, our client can activate their IP in doing so um, to create that ecosystem, to get that going. And then we have these raw uh, red, the red circles, uh, which has this sort of brick next to it, we call it a proprietary approach. These are areas where we actually believe that we want to be, you, we want to compete in this space. This is our competitive advantages that we want to create by being the sort of sole supplier of the premium level or the high-end functionality uh, that these uh, uh, activities generates. So here we want to have a closed approach. In the ecosystem, we want to have an open approach. Uh, and the sort of the blue ones are also a, like a little open approach uh, kind of aspects of the offering. Uh, and I realize I just used that word as describing the ecosystem, but it's 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 the open approach. What we mean here is that it's uh, not, uh, we don't really care if anybody else takes our technology and run with it. Basically, it should be open. It should be... And in these days, I suppose Tesla is one of the more prominent companies doing that when they communicate that they say oh, all our battery technology or our charging technology patents should be free uh, or you can license them for free, etc. That's the kind of approach that we think this company should have for, for activity B and A, the dock and the unit. And, and there's a reason for that because if they don't do that, it's likely that, that, that this, the venture itself uh, is 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 um, too well protected, so it doesn't get any market traction. Um, sometimes it's good if there have if, if there are competitors out there doing the same thing, building the market, building an acceptance for the technology. And these two areas is where we think that's that's where they how they should should use or how they should think um, when it comes to IP. Uh, that's a sort of a summary in this particular project uh, when it comes to sort of the effects generator and the aftermath. Uh, obviously. Doing this project, the, the, the client realized that this, you know there's this really much, what they're really trying to do here is building a new innovative value chain, and and that really puts uh, the the need or the use of IP on on, on display, uh, and 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 they really need to think differently when it comes to to the proprietary approach. Uh, and also we could highlight you know, the, the patents, the trademarks, the data that they had within the venture and what kind of value it creates and how it can be used to create even more value with an open closed strategy. Uh, we could reallocate patent costs to more, you know, the areas of the sort of context where we believe they need them for a proprietary approach, for instance, and perhaps less so in the open areas. Um, to use the IP to trade or as a currency in negotiation with partners, given that they have a firm understanding of how it could be used for their own business. They don't have to be so afraid of, of interacting with others uh, because they have sort of an advantage of, of knowing. Uh, and also, in general, understanding potential partners and competition uh, in relation to their own technology and the IP space. Uh, and and uh, based on a business joint IP analysis rather than a pure IP landscaping analysis, which is more standardized in our industry. Uh, I think that was it from my side. I tried to speak as slow as I could, but uh, being mindful of time, I realized I, I spoke quite fast. Uh, Thank you very much, Eric. That's, uh, that, that's great. And um, 
certainly it was it was very clear coming over very clear and uh, sound and that on my side so uh, thank you very much for that and thank you very much for going through that sort of detail of the case study which as i've been popping through the chat as we've been going through here um you know what eric has gone into the a deep dive into one particular value chain within this sort of oil um venture sort of type sector but hopefully you can see the sort of comparison if you're doing a health application if you're doing electric vehicle application or like the the battery value chain that i was talking about going in to depth about understanding which parts of the ecosystem that you want to be freely available you know mm. data standards uh being able to have standards you know across the whole industry for batteries to be switchable or be chargeable at all sorts of places and where you want to protect particular aspects of it where you then want to capture the intellectual property and assets and that, that across that that chain um, I've got a question I'll ask Eric, but please feel free in a moment to, uh, we'll ask you to unmute and you ask your questions. But what, Eric, I wanted to ask you one, because you raised it regarding the Tesla and battery technologies that they're looking to make these things sort of freely available. Um, one of the examples I gave in the China session that, that I did a couple of weeks ago was comparing the patent portfolios for CATL, which is a Chinese um battery manufacturer and how they've now got a lot more patents lodged in the last two years compared to panasonic and also we compared byd which is the chinese electric car business compared that to the tesla patents and, and we saw a much larger broader uh, patent portfolio from byd globally compared to tesla so my question really is you know can tesla really say oh look you can you can freely use the things that we've created if they haven't really protected it because if somebody else goes and protects that patent and protects that technology um you know and follows the rules of intellectual property sort of protection how can tesla sort of say oh yeah you can freely go and use the stuff that we've done if they haven't patented have you got a view on on that type of t type of thing of protecting and making it freely available as opposed to um, making it proprietary i think it's a sort of a, a solid point i think it's sort of you you're really hitting the nail here when it comes to some of the fundamental aspects of being open when it comes to to a global technology landscape in order to be open you need to have what we call control and that could be you can create that control by filing patents or 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 other means of control as well but typically in the technology space is much much related to 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 what kind of patent portfolio you can build and once you have a patent portfolio you can start figuring out how you could use it and i'm not sure that that what but elon musk and the tesla people are saying is as you say yourself given you just look at the sheer volume of ip that that sort of promise to the market is absolutely correct uh, I think there is there is probably many aspects of an electronic vehicle, and also charging it and next generation batteries, etc. Uh, that that there will that is more problematic than than what Tesla would like to uh, you know communicate when it comes to openness and, and who's actually in control of that technology. Uh, and 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 in a in a sense, in order to have sort of like an open closed strategy. The, the downside of that is typically always you need to have some like a first mover advantage because this is all there lots of IP in the space you're moving into. It's typically hard to build an open close strategy uh, because you know others will dictate the terms of, of, of uh, uh, the protection of the technology. Okay, that's great. Thank, thank you, Eric. Thank you all for participating in the session today. Thank you very much, Eric, for your contribution and insights it's been a pleasure working with you on these other projects and been a pleasure working with you in in creating this webinar um as i've highlighted we've got um uh, videos and podcasts from previous sessions and uh, we've got upcoming events with henkel um in two weeks time talking about the how to do deals and how to do new deals during this pandemic when it's difficult to meet people physically and see their devices and sort of things like that. Uh, we've got Shell speaking at the beginning of September about the transformation that's happening from oil and uh, into uh, new energy systems. And later in September, I'm discussing with Innovate UK 
um, the technology support uh, for, for ventures and startups and the potential spin outs from corporates that, um, that I highlighted in briefly in my introduction and that as well. So if there's no other comments, thank you all for participating in that today. Very good to thank see you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, look forward to seeing you all again in a future session. Thank you very yes, much. Be safe. Bye bye.